specifically highlight the role of our geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering community on addressing climate mitigation and climate adaptation strategies. I'm then going to discuss some of my own work, which has been exploring green infrastructure for climate resilience before making some summary remarks and drawing some conclusions. So our college our colleagues in climate science project that climate change will cause a rise in sea levels, an increase in average surface temperatures, changes in patterns and amount of precipitation, a decline in snow cover, permafrost and sea ice, acidification of the oceans, an increase in the frequency, intensity and duration of extreme events, and a general overall change in ecosystem characteristics. These changes are going to significantly affect our water resources, which is something that geotechnical engineers have been involved in for many years. They're also going to significantly impact our infrastructure systems, which are also key to geotechnical engineering research design and practice. In addition, we can expect impacts to our food supply, ecosystems, human health and well-being, something which we all should be concerned about. If we look at the global diagrams for sea level rise and temperature rise, um, we'll find that most of these are quite familiar to us. On the left, we see projected global temperature rises. Sorry, on the left, we see projected um, global sea level rises. And on the right, we see projected global temperature rises. I just want to draw your attention to two things on these diagrams. First, the significant uncertainty in these projections which challenges engineering design and solutions. For example, if we look at the left-hand diagram um, and examine projected changes in global sea level rise going forward into the 21st century, we see ranges that span multiple feet. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is that the lower bounds of impacts on both of these diagrams are associated with low carbon emission strategies. So going forward, the necessity to reduce carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalent emissions um, cannot be overstressed when we think about reducing climate change impacts. When we think about engineering solutions to climate change, though, we really need to think about solutions for specific communities, which means that we need to deal with local rather than global impacts. And the variability in local impacts itself can be quite significant. This is on top of the variability that we see in global climate change projections. So if we look at the diagram on the left hand side, we can see that for projected sea level rises, the eastern and southern seaboards of the United States are much more vulnerable than the western seaboard. For temperature rises, which are shown on the right hand side, the interior of the US is much more vulnerable than the coastlines. If we move on to look at precipitation changes, and precipitation is something that is significant to many of our geotechnical engineering designs and solution imp implementations, we'll see that the US is projected to experience anything from 30% less to 30% more annual precipitation over the next century if we cannot reduce um, CO2 or CO2 equivalent emissions. Overall, climate change currently poses multiple challenges, which include a need to improve climate, global climate change scenarios um, in order to reduce uncertainty. This is essential for those of us who are in geotechnical engineering research and practice. It's very difficult for us to move solutions forward. Um, the impacts of climate change, including sea level rise, um, global temperature changes, and changes in precipitation patterns, which means that we need to advance clean energy technologies, improve energy efficiency, think about sequestering and storing CO2 and CO2 equivalent, um, and also understanding the progress that we're making in each of these areas. In addition, we need to develop adaptation strategies um, because no matter what pathway we're on for reducing CO2 or CO2 equivalent emissions, um, we are gonna see some impacts related to climate change, uh, which means that 
we are going to have to move forward with ensuring that we reduce human vulnerability to issues like sea level rise, um, temperature increases, and precipitation changes. And finally, I, I put something in here. I think there's also a need for us to think about climate communications as a global strategy um, to allow people to understand um, what climate impacts uh, are going to be doing um, into the coming 21st century, particularly with respect to what it means for their individual living conditions. Now, the role that engineers need to play in meeting the climate challenge is um, indisputable. As illustrated here in Engineering News Record, which was published less than a year ago, engineers have become increasingly and actively involved in the political and technical discussions surrounding the way the world can mitigate and adapt to climate change. Now, in particular, geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers have their own roles to play. I'm going to highlight a few areas where we can contribute, which are discussed in more detail in a book chapter, which I've highlighted on this slide here, that I co-authored with my colleagues, Professor Andrew Whittle and Professor James Mitchell. One important area where geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers have a role to play um, is in contributing to CO2 equivalent emissions reduction and the development of a low carbon economy. I've highlighted some areas here where advances are needed. Um, specifically, we need advances to promote geothermal energy. Um, we need to look at how to extract um, energy from the subsurface as is illustrated in this diagram here. So how to undertake and expand universal heat mining. There's also opportunities for geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers to advance geothermal energy so that we can participate in seasonal heat exchanges, which can buffer us against winter and summer temperatures without increasing carbon emissions. With respect to wind energy, there is a lot of contributions that geotechnical engineers can make um, for improving foundations, particularly the cost of foundations for offshore wind farms. But even if we have significant offshore wind, we need to think about mitigating the intermittency of um, clean energy solutions, uh, such as wind energy, and compressed air storage is one opportunity that geotechnical engineers can contribute to when, it think, when we think about how to deal with the ups and downs of um, clean energy solutions like wind energy. Hydropower is another area where geotechnical engineers can contribute to advancing a low carbon economy, in particular thinking about issues related to dam safety, and maybe more importantly, the environmental impacts of dam projects. And finally, carbon capture and storage, um, which is a way of stripping CO2 and CO2 equivalent um, from emissions stacks and from the atmosphere in general. Um, a lot of the solutions that are being proposed for carbon capture and storage involve subsurface solutions where geotechnical engineers have a lot to contribute when it comes to estimating storage capacities for underground CO2 or CO2 equivalent reservoirs, the thinking about sustainable injection rates of CO2 that's stripped from the air and stored underground. Um, and also when it comes to the safety and viability of carbon capture and storage solutions that involve underground reservoirs, um, much work is still needed to understand fate and transport processes. When it comes to adaptation, um, geotechnical engineers um, can contribute in many areas. This is where most of my own work has been focusing recently. Um, advances are needed to allow um, humans to adapt and to reduce vulnerability to issues that involve too much and too little water. If you recall, when we looked at the precipitation changes across the US that are projected under 
different climate scenarios. It's possible that we're going to see anything from a 30% reduction to a 30% increase in precipitation if we don't reduce CO2 emissions or equivalents. That means that we're going to be dealing with issues um, that relate to flooding. So we need to adapt to increase water in some areas which is gonna have impacts related to slope stability. In other areas where we're seeing reduced precipitation, we're going to have to adapt to um, lower uh, water availability. So we're gonna to have to think about how to provide communities with reliable water supplies. Um, there are gonna be some areas of the country where we have lower precipitation, um, where we're gonna to have to be thinking about how we can contribute to dust control under quite extreme dry conditions. And I've called out the changing Arctic um, specifically here because the challenges that are related to loss of permafrost and changing land sea levels in, in Arctic regions uh, are quite specific. And there's a, an awful lot that geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers can contribute when it comes to adaptation under very vulnerable environments um, such as the Arctic. I'm now gonna move on um, and discuss some of my own work in climate adaptation, which involves green infrastructure for urban climate resilience. It's an area that myself and my collaborators and the 20 students that I showed on the introduction slide um, have been examining um, potential solutions for well over a decade now. We became involved um, in green infrastructure and the role of geoenvironmental engineering in green infrastructure over um, well over a decade ago. And it was actually as a result of New York City's green infrastructure plan, which at the time was a 20 year multi-billion dollar plan to deal with the city's stormwater management issues. Uh, so it wasn't a plan that was initially intended uh, to deal with climate adaptation and climate resilience issues. And I've got a couple of slides here that explain some of the stormwater management issues that New York City and other urban environments face. Um, here is a slide that shows pre-development conditions. So this is a landscape that might have existed um, and still exists in some areas of, of the country prior to um, human settlement um, at great density. And what we see in the bottom right-hand side of this slide is the water cycle under pre-development conditions. Um, what you can see is when precipitation falls on a pre-development landscape, about 40% of the precipitation returns to the atmosphere in the form of evapotranspiration. About 50% of precipitation infiltrates the subsurface either as shallow or deep infiltration, and only about 10% of precipitation that falls on a landscape like this um, runs off the surface and recharges uh, local, local water bodies, um, local lakes, and local streams. If we look at an urban landscape, um, we see widespread imperviousness, so it's very different different to the pre-development landscape that we saw in the previous slide. And if we look at the hydrological uh, cycle, um, when we're dealing with a landscape that's heavily developed and has a high population density, we'll see that precipitation that forms, falls on a landscape such as this, only 30% of it returns to the atmosphere via evapotranspiration. So there's reduced evapotranspiration in many uh, urban landscapes. Um, because of widespread imperviousness, only 15% makes its way um, to, into the subsurface, 10% um, shallow infiltration and 5% deep infiltration, which means that 55% of precipitation that forms on an urban landscape um, runs off the surface. Um, this means that widespread imperviousness in urban landscapes, um, as we've seen human densification and the increase of urbanization has created a waste disposal problem, uh, which is referred to as a stormwater runoff problem. That comes off the impervious surface 
overwhelms existing sewer systems. I'm showing here a combined sewer system and on, on the bottom diagram, a separate sewer system. Um, and the, the, the stormwater that overwhelms these sewer systems actually goes directly into local water bodies as illustrated in this picture, causing widespread pollution. So to deal with this issue, cities like New York City started to look to restore the urban landscape to its pre-development condition by adding more greenery. So if we see this picture here, uh, this is New York City as it exists today, and this is a rendering of New York City as it might have existed in pre-development times. And if you recall the previous slides where we were looking at the hydrological cycle, the hydrological cycle under this dense urban environment is generating a lot of stormwater runoff, whereas the hydrological cycle under this pre-development environment is generating very little stormwater runoff. And so the vision of green infrastructure plans such as those in New York City that were initially introduced about a decade ago was to try and restore the hydrological cycle of pre-development times um, by introducing wide scale, wide scale um, greenery. And here we actually see a picture um, of one possibility where an artist has imagined that every roof in New York City is green. And by greening every roof in New York City, we're going to see a, a movement of the hydrological cycle from the current condition uh, to a condition that might more represent pre-development times. Of course, green roofs are not the only way to introduce greenery into dense urban environments like New York City. There are other ways to introduce greenery, such as green streets, uh, vine, vine, vine canopies, urban street trees, and right-of-way bias whales, which are all illustrated in this slide here. Um, my research group with colleagues have actually studied the ability of all of these green infrastructure systems to capture stormwater runoff and prevent water pollution and local flooding with an initial emphasis on the role of green infrastructure for urban stormwater mitigation. But as we've become more and more interested in how geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers can contribute to climate resiliency and meet the climate challenge that we all face as a society moving forward into the 21st century, we started to examine how these different green infrastructure systems um, might be able to help urban communities adapt to the impacts of climate change with a specific emphasis on water management and urban heat island management, and um, a small emphasis on CO2 sequestration and the reduction of building energy consumption. So I'm briefly going to show some data from our green roof research, um, data from the work that we've done looking at um, the role of vine canopies and bias whales can be found in, in my group's um, publications. I'm going to start off by showing this cross section through an extensive green roof to illustrate that green infrastructure actually are highly engineered systems. Um, they're not systems um, that just involve um, soils and uh, vegetated um, vegetated interventions as systems that involve multiple layers that are highly engineered. Uh, so if we look at the components of a cross section through an intensive green roof, which I've illustrated on the screen here, we'll see at the base of the green roof cross section, there are geotechnic, geotextiles, something that geoenvironmental engineers have been advancing for years. There are geofabrics, um, another area where geoenvironmental engineering research and practice has made significant contributions. Above these two base layers, there's a growing media. This is actually an engineered soil um, that is lightweight um, and has a reasonable um, drainage capacity, but also a capacity to hold moisture 
so that it can support the vegetative system at the top. What is quite interesting about this system, in addition to the engineered layers that we as geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers can contribute to advancing and designing, is the vegetated layer. So the vegetated layer actually makes this a living engineered system, which means that its performance varies over time, which is something that myself, my students, and my colleagues that have been working on green infrastructure have found to be very interesting. And it's often not something um, that we encounter in many of the engineering systems that we design, operate, and maintain. So we've actually been monitoring green roof performance at several sites around New York City for well over nine years. We have information about stormwater retention for different roof types. We have information um, about how stormwater retention varies with different storm sizes. We also have information about how green roof performance itself evolves over time. Um, and you can see um, in these diagrams here, some of the locations of the different green roofs that we've been studying how green roof water retention varies with storm size, how green roof water retention varies with the age of the green roof. And probably at the bottom here is the most important diagram because we've been able to develop some design co curves that show overall how green roof systems retain water during different storm events. We found that the annual stormwater retention of green roofs are generally above 40%, but there's a range of between 15 and 30% for design storms that range from a two to a one in a hundred year um, return period. So these are the type of design curves that might be used um, for examining the role of green infrastructure in climate resiliency under climate conditions such as New York City, where we were actually going to be expecting increased precipitation over time as we move further forward into the 21st century. Um, but pursuant to our interest in understanding the role of green infrastructure in climate resilience, we've also started to look at the ability of green roofs to improve local evapotranspiration. So, to perhaps cool urban environments during hot weather, um, as we do anticipate an increase in global temperatures, albeit the increase um, being determined by your local location as we move for further forward into the 21st century. So on the top here, you actually, you actually um, see an infrared picture that provides information about the different surface temperatures of the elements that are shown on the left here. So you can see it's significantly lower surface temperature associated with this um, green strip. This happens to be a green roof um, compared to this black strip. And this happens to be a tr traditional um, asphalt roof. In actual fact, the difference in the surface temperatures uh, between these different surface treatments is quite dramatic. But when we think about cooling urban environments, it's not actually the surface temperatures that we're interested in. It's, it's cooling the local air temperatures. And I've got a, a slide a little bit further on that illustrates some of the research the interdisciplinary group has been conducted in that area. Um, but we have what we have done in order to understand how green infrastructure might cool urban environments is develop some sophisticated models that relate evapotranspiration of green infrastructure to local air temperatures and local relative humidities um, as a way of starting to understand the role of green infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis climate resilience in areas, in particularly urban areas, where we're going to see significant increases in local temperatures. 
We've actually also looked at the ability of green roofs to sequester CO2 and to reduce building energy consumption. Um, green roofs do sequester uh, CO2, um, but with respect to the magnitude of CO2 that gets sequestered, um, in comparison to street trees, um, it's nothing really significant. And when we've looked at the role of green roofs in reducing building energy consumption, um, we also haven't found them to be particularly effective in comparison to other technologies that we might want to adopt as engineers. Um, so I'm now going to move on to what's happening at a citywide scale when it comes to green infrastructure and climate resistance. I just want resilience apologies. I, I just want to remind you that many cities adopted green infrastructure plans, including New York City, to deal with stormwater management issues that arose because widespread imperviousness in cities significantly disrupted hydrological cycles, causing stormwater management issues. And many research groups, including my own, started studying the performance of green infrastructure as a result of cities' interest in green infrastructure for stormwater management. But what we've seen over the past several years has been quite interesting. We've seen um, an expansion of people's interest in green infrastructure for climate resilience. And this expansion has included expansion and interest in cities like New York City. Um, so there's now recognition that green infrastructure might not just be affected for stormwater management, and recall this is why it was adopted by many cities. It might actually help with local water capture and reuse, which could reduce the energy associated uh, with water capture and reuse, but also could help cities that are undergoing water stress. So they're not going to be experiencing an increase in precipitation as we move further forward into the 21st century. They're going to be experiencing a decrease in precipitation. And, and so they're concerned about locally capturing water and reusing it. There's a lot of interest in the role of green infrastructure and urban heat island mitigation, particularly in areas where we're expected to see significant increases in temperature, which is going to cause heat stress, um, which is obviously going to affect human health and well-being. There has been interest in the role of green infrastructure in lowering building energy demands, which is to do with carbon mitigation in coastal resiliency. So can green infrastructure help combat some of the negative impacts of sea level rise? And there's been an interest um, in reducing water energy costs, something that I've already mentioned. So I have a PhD student, Charles Axelson, who's doing his PhD at the University of Venice, and he's been visiting my research group recently. And he started to examine climate policy documents for several major cities around the world. These include New York City, Vancouver, Sydney, Auckland, Copenhagen, and Amsterdam. And he's found that green infrastructure is playing an increasingly important role in city planning for climate resilience. Um, so these are, this is a, a paper that is currently in press that Charles took the lead in writing. Um, but these are the, are the number of times that green infrastructure is mentioned in the different policy documents that are to do with climate resilience for each of these cities. And the end is the number of policy documents that were examined. Um, but in all city cases, public green infrastructure has now been cited as something that is gaining increasing importance in urban climate resilience. Um, and in some cities, particularly European cities, private green infrastructure has also um, been cited as having a significant role or a potential significant role moving forward. Um, however, my group has actually, um, as well as others, um, been engaged in 
in some discussion and research that reveals several challenges related to the role of green infrastructure for climate resilience. And I've cited some of these challenges here and I'm, I'm going to spend the remainder of the presentation um, just talking a little bit more about some of these challenges. And um, as engineers, whenever we hear challenges, we also think about opportunities. Um, so this means that there are many contributions that we as geotechnical and geo-environmental engineers can play um, in ensuring that cities that are increasingly relying on strategies like green infrastructure for climate resilience are successful in achieving their goals. Um, but one of the um, challenges um, that's prob probably clear to many of us on our call is the scale of green infrastructure implementation that is going to be needed in our major cities to really, <coughs> apologies, um, to really make progress on climate resilience. Um, the New York City Green Infrastructure Plan, which I mentioned was a, was a 20 year plan that involves billions of dollars of investment has already inserted tens and thousands of local vegetated strategies into the city landscape. Um, but in order to deal with the projected um, increased precipitation, increased flooding and increased heat projections that New York City is expecting to face, the uh, integration of green infrastructure needs to be order of magnitude greater. So there's a significant scale of green infrastructure implementation that's going to be needed in any city that's relying on green infrastructure heavily for climate resistance, resilience, I'm, apologies. So this means that we're gonna to have to think about public private partnerships because the opportunity to put green infrastructure on public land is limited in any city. Um, so we're gonna to have to be thinking about opportunities for inserting green infrastructure on private properties. And this, this is really an area um, where our European colleagues are definitely ahead of us. The other thing that I think is interesting to us as engineers um, is how do we predict and forecast the performance of a system that involves thousands and thousands of interventions? So in the case of green infrastructure, um, thousands if not tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of um, interventions such as uh, green roofs, green streets, right-of-way, bioscales. Uh, we're used to designing systems that, that have very many components, but not systems that have the vast number of components that these systems are going to have to have to be effective. I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of green infrastructure in mitigating the urban heat island. I think there's a lot, those of you that are interested in, um, in the topic of green infrastructure and urban climate resilience, I think there's a lot of opportunity to understand um, whether green infrastructure um, has a role to play in reducing temperatures in urban environments because there's a there's a lot of data out there that's quite contradictory, um, and you know so that means there's a lot of opportunity for us as engineers to to make real progress in quantifying what is happening in this area. I'm going to talk a little bit about public stakeholder acceptance. I, I think this is something particularly when we think about climate adaptation and resilience that we as engineers might need to pay more attention to. And I'll talk a little bit about governance requirements, which I think is a, another area where we potentially might have to pay more attention. And as I mentioned at the end of 2019, there was a lot more engagement of engineers um, in policy and governance uh, discussions that went on in, Ma in the Madrid um, climate summit. So this is definitely an area where we're moving into more engagement and we, can, we continue to have to move into more engagement. Um, so let me talk about some of these challenges in the next few slides. <clears throat> 
I'm going to talk about the challenge of forecasting system level performance. So my research group and very many others have spent considerable time and effort quantifying the performance of different green infrastructure interventions. I showed earlier some slides that illustrated some of the findings um, that we have uncovered in monitoring the performance of individual green roofs over a period of nine years. Um, we also have data that can quantify the performance of individual street trees. We have data that can quantify the performance of individual vine canopies. We have data that can quantify the performance of individual right-of-way bioswales or rain gardens. Um, but if we're really interested in designing a green infrastructure system that meets the goals of urban climate resilience, we're going to have to be able to forecast the performance of multiple tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of green infrastructure interventions. So we, we need to go well beyond understanding how a, a different component of this system works. So we've been working on combining statistic, statistic, statistical modeling approaches with affordable monitoring technology to try and develop citywide performance metrics that really looks at how widespread green infrastructure intervention um, might manage increased water in New York City, increased temperatures in New York City, um, and increased flooding as a result of sea level rise. So we've been working with GIS experts to develop a fine, scale, a fine spatial scale map of land cover in New York City, which is shown to the left here at a resolution of less than a meter by a meter squared. So we actually have the land cover in New York City cataloged into a hundred different categories at a resolution of one meter by one meter. And we're combining that with low cost monitoring techniques. So we've been looking at soil moisture probes and such as in different green infrastructure interventions. So we've been trying to combine land cover with low, mon low cost monitoring techniques to develop system level performance. So this is an alternative approach to process-based modeling approaches and it's rapidly becoming a data science problem, um, which, which means that, apologies, it's rapidly becoming a data science problem. Um, because we're, we're, com we're combining large scale uh, data sets with statistical models and smaller scale data sets to actually make predictions and forecasts. Um, and I actually believe that our geotechnical community has a lot to gain from adopting data science approaches and some of the problems we tackle, especially those that are associated with issues like climate change, because the process-based models that we're currently using including those that uh, rely on models that have been developed by our colleagues in climate science involve a lot of uncertainty. So if you cast your mind back to one of the original slides that I showed during this presentation, and we look at some of the forecasts that are available for sea level rise and for temperature rise at a global scale, it's not difficult for us to understand that the level of uncertainty embedded even in the climate forecast models is going to translate into a lot of uncertainty in process-based models. Um, so models that combine statistics with real-time monitoring might offer us a better way forward when it comes to understanding how certain strategies are going to help us combat climate change as we move for, further forward in into the 21st century. The second thing that I'd like to talk about um, is some of the work that we've been doing looking at how greenery reduces local air temperatures. 
So with a lot of the promise that is being claimed about green infrastructure and urban heat island mitigation is actually based on surface temperature maps, like this one that is shown to the left-hand side here, which is the surface temperature map of New York City, um, where the red, the red uh, areas um, are illustrating high surface temperatures in, in the city in the evening, uh, which sort of are going to be driving increased air conditioning loads, which is going, which are going to be driving increased uh, CO2 emissions if we're not relying on clean energy sources. But they're also going to be increasing health stress, particularly among the um, elderly urban poor, which is, is result of which is resulting in a lot of negative health impacts during high summer temperatures in New York City. Um, so these are surface temperatures. But if you actually look at this uh, rectangle here, which is Central Park, you'll you'll see that surface temperatures, land surface temperatures associated with greenery, are much lower, and that's that's why many people have been. Um, interested in introducing more vegetation and greenery into urban environments to, to reduce urban heat stress now and moving forward into the 21st century as we anticipate higher, um, higher global air temperatures. So this is a, this is a transverse that is, that is taken through cent Central Park um, in an evening that actually illustrates not the reduction in surface temperature, but the reduction in air temperature that's associated with actually what is a very massive piece of greenery in the middle of the dense urban environment of New York City. And if you look at the air temperature that's associated with this transverse, this diagram here shows surface temperatures, not air temperatures. We see that the local air temperatures, even in this large open green space, are only about one degree C low, lower than the air temperatures in the surrounding dense urban environment. Um, so this, this speaks to the need for much, much more understanding, much more research, and um, much more modeling to, to really unpack how green infrastructure can feed into urban climate resilience plans when it comes to reducing urban heat island and man managing rising, um, rising urban temperatures as we move further forward into the 21st century. The next slide that I have, I think is quite interesting. Um, so this, this concerns public acceptance of green infrastructure that's placed in the public right of way. So this is a lady in Queens, New York City, that is not happy that a right of way bioswale has, has come to her neighborhood. Uh, she's complaining that it's impacting street parking, that the plants are not well maintained, so it's unsightly. She's complaining that it's attracting insects and it's uh, attracting rats. So what's, what's interesting about the role of public acceptance and green infrastructure strategies that involve increasing vegetation in public right of way which is the primary strategy right now in many cities like New York City, is that public stewardship of these engineered interventions is actually going to impact their performance. So as an engineer, if I design a vegetated system that has an engineered soil and various uh, layers of geotextiles, and you can see here a gravel layer that's been exposed, and when the public interacts with my engineering intervention, they actually disturb to what I've designed, the system isn't gonna perform as I've designed. So it's, it's really important when we think about climate adaptation and climate mitigation strategies like green infrastructure that involve interventions that interact with the public that we 
understand, and we encourage public acceptance. Um, in New York City, um, the public acceptance or lack of acceptance uh, possibly has to do with the way the city has approached the implementation of green infrastructure in the public right of way. It's, it's been fairly top down. Um, and unless there are ADA conditions, um, members of the public like this lady really, really have no choice about whether a right of way bioswale comes their way. On the West Coast, uh, there's been a slightly different approach and, and neighborhoods are actually allowed to ask their city to implement infrastructures like this in the public right of way. So there's been a lot more public acceptance. Uh, so in, in this particular um, in this in this particular incidence, uh, it's it's probably going to require a lot more public engagement um, in order for these interventions to to be steward, stewarded in ways that are helpful for the performance of the green infrastructure itself. We've actually been looking at why people do value green infrastructure in cities so that we can ensure that there's public acceptability of green infrastructure, particularly given that many cities are relying heavily on green infrastructure design for climate resilience. And our work has actually found that people value green infrastructure more for the cultural services that green, green spaces provide um, than for the role that green infrastructure plays in providing environmental services like stormwater management. So again, our, our findings here speak to the need for engineers who are involved in green infrastructure designs for climate resilience to really consider how green infrastructure interfaces with the public and what form of green infrastructure best meets the needs of climate resilience as well as public acceptance and public well-being. Which means that we as geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers um, might need to come up with different green infrastructure designs so that this intersection between um, public well-being and public acceptance and the different performance metrics that are associated with climate resilience, including water management and potentially urban heat island management, um, come together in ways that are synergistic um, and symbiotic. Just as an aside, we've been quite lucky to receive a rapid grant from the National Science Foundation to study how access to green space has impacted health and well-being during the pandemic. And we've actually found that access to green space does improve subjective well-being, at least among the communities that we've surveyed who have been under stay-at-home orders um, during the pandemic. So, so clearly this intersection between climate resilience, public well-being, green spaces, and green infrastructure is quite complex um, and something that we as engineers need to think through as we get more and more engaged in combating the climate challenge. I just want to move on to talk a little bit about green infrastructure as a class of distributed infrastructure. I think this is quite interesting in general um, for us engineers. So distributed infrastructure is an infrastructure class that is gaining more attention day by day as a means of supplementing or even replacing traditional centralized infrastructure. Um, one reason is that uh, distributed or decentralized systems such as green infrastructure are flexible and adaptable over time. So they can actually help with issues related to the uncertainty of climate impacts. And another reason is that they can be financed over time. Um, so they avoid the immediate costs of some large scale climate mitigation schemes that um, are an alternative to distributed forms of infrastructure. So what do I mean by distributed forms of infrastructure versus centralized forms of infrastructure? Well, there's an illustration to the left-hand side of this slide um, that shows a distributed form of energy infrastructure, and it's the solar panels that are on each of the houses that are shown here. 
uh, or the solar panels that are illustrated in this community solar farm. So um, these solar panel il illust illustrations are a form of distributed infrastructure because they're providing energy to communities um, as an alternative to energy that might be provided by a centralized power plant uh, that could be a power plant that's running on fossil fuels or even a nuclear power plant. Um, so that so it's a distributed energy supply system and not one large centralized energy supply system. Another example of a distributed water supply system is rainwater harvesting. This is a distributed system that has been in place for, for centuries and centuries. Um, or local water treatment in, in buildings, which is a technology that is advancing quite rapidly um, and is allowing some buildings to go off the grid vis-a-vis -vis water supply. So these are, these are distributed or localized ways um, of obtaining water for households to communities that can replace centralized systems such as reservoir systems and green infrastructure is another distributed system. Um, because it involves thousands and thousands of greening interventions as an alternative to a large centralized um, sewerage treatment plant that would otherwise be collecting stormwater and treating it before it's ejected into local water bodies. So all of these systems have potential to help with climate resilience. Um, the solar systems have potential to help because they're their clean energy alternatives, so they can contribute to the low carbon economy, which can get us on low carbon emissions curves, so it can reduce the worst impacts of climate change. Um, water, these distributed water supply systems can help with water resilience and also reduce the energy costs associated with centralized water supply systems. And we've already, already talked about green infrastructure for climate resilience when it comes to water management, potentially urban heat island management and you know some other, other benefits such as building cooling. One thing that is quite interesting about these systems though uh, is that um, they're going to require quite different um, governance and policy um, interventions. And this is a slide that has been, uh, that illustrates work that's been conducted by Professor Rick Fayok that shows that if we want to adopt um, some decentralized forms of infrastructure, we need a certain type of governance environment. So this is the more decentralized approaches. So what's interesting about this is that decentralized physical infrastructure interventions require better centralized governance. The other thing that's interesting about these, these systems, um, which I've already touched upon, is because they have very, very many components, um, in order to really understand their performance, um, to monitor it and to maintain the performance, we're probably gonna to have to use big data or data science approaches. So we're gonna to have to combine statistical approaches with distributed monitoring, and we're gonna to have to combine all of that data somehow centrally in order that we can deal with the tens of thousands of decentralized components that the infrastructure physically has. So again, we're going to be able, we're going to have to need cent centralized data management approaches. Um, so in summary, if we have decentralized physical components, we need strong centralized governance and we probably need centralized monitoring predictive and maintenance requirements. Um, so, so we're sort of moving into infrastructure design realms that are new to engineers, which I think is actually quite exciting. Um, but are also going to offer us as an engineering community, um, including a geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering community, some, some um, real new ways of thinking and some real new challenges moving forward.
So I've only got two more slides. Um, one is um, summarizing um, what I've been discussing over the last hour. Um, it's pretty clear that engineers have to be actively involved in the climate discussion. In particular, we have a lot to contribute technically when it comes to climate mitigation and moving our clean energy economy forward, but we also have a lot to contribute when it comes to adapting to climate change and improving climate resiliency. In order to do so, we really need to engage in the political as well as the technical discussions that are going on in this important area. Um, I spoke a lot about some of the climate resilience work that I'm involved in, and it involves uh, green infrastructure as a mechanism uh, for urban environments dealing with water management issues that are associated with climate change, urban cooling issues that are associated with climate change, and also to some extent energy management issues that are associated with climate change. So that was one illustration of how geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers are contributing and still have a lot to contribute to the climate, to the climate challenge that we face societally. And, you know, and then finally, I tried to highlight that there are many interesting topics that still need to be addressed by our geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering community and engineers at large. Uh, the green infrastructure illustration that I provided um, is a distributed infrastructure solution. Uh, many of us have studied how individual components of green infrastructure perform, but we've yet to really understand how, how the system of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of green infrastructure infrastructures um, perform as a whole. Um, it's pretty clear that the scale of green infrastructure implementation that's required to meet many cities' climate resilience plans is, is, is going to be huge. Um, so there's a lot to think through when it comes to getting to that scale. When it comes to thinking about system performance and maintenance, I think there's a large role for data science, internet of things and artificial intelligence to, to play. I just touched a little bit on the work that my group is getting into in this area, but I think in general, this is a, this is a field for all of us as engineers to get engaged in and I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to meet very many challenges if we start to incorporate these approaches into our geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering research um, and design practices. We've talked a little bit about governance questions and about um, stakeholder involvement including um, societal issues uh, where we really have to ensure that whatever we're designing in the public right of way, and that includes green infrastructure, really meshes properly with public values and acceptance. And I finally just want to um, say that there are some very many questions that, that concern equity in this area that I haven't actually touched on, but I think we're all aware that uh, climate impacts are going to um, be felt most severely by communities that are low resourced both in the US and also globally. And as we think about designs for climate adaptation and climate resilience, we also need to be thinking about designs and solutions that are going to work with communities um, that are already extremely vulnerable and are only going to be increasing in vulnerability um, as, as we experience some of the impacts of climate change moving further forward into the 21st century. So that's, that's the many slides.